I was born in Atlanta, Georgia. Moved here when I was six months old, and I've pretty much grown up here uh, in Lincoln County. Growing up, I guess my relationship with my parents was, it was kind of a double-edged sword, I guess, with my dad. Uh, of course, my parents divorced at a young age. I mean, my parents divorced when I was 11 years old. So, uh, I mean, I, I guess in society's eyes, you might say I had a good relationship with my parents. I didn't have a bad relationship with them. But as an adult, now that I've gotten older, I look back on it, and uh, it could have been a little better. I mean, it wasn't long after I graduated. I was gonna be this big badass and move out and get, you know, be my own man. You know, I had a car. I mean, I, you know, I had clothes. I had a job. I was working part time at Red Food or by Lowe's. It used to be there in Fed with a shutdown now. And uh, I decided I was gonna move out. Well, I moved out, but I didn't have nowhere to go. You know, so. I went over to, uh, I can't even say he was a friend. It was just, been out partying with him all night. You know, doing, drinking it up, doping it up. Went over to this chick's house and she wasn't nothing but a whore. You know, I mean, cause I, she ain't gonna tell how many guys she'd slept with. I don't even know where the dude is now, but I remember laying on the couch that night over at his, their, her apartment. She lived down in Mayberry Courts in fed with the projects. Which, you know, I don't necessarily have anything wrong with the projects, you know. I mean, you do what you gotta do to take care of your family, and there's a lot of good people that come out of the projects. So I'm not gonna knock that. But, um, this particular situation, I'll knock it. But I remember laying on that couch drunk, done been drinking all day. It was like three or four o'clock in the morning. He was over there. I mean, with me laying there on the couch, on the love seat, he's on the other couch as far from here to. I mean, we're close. I mean, we're not even five feet from each other. And he's over there the hell out of that girl, right next to me. I thought at that time, man, if this is a life of being out on your own, if this is what life's all about, I don't want no part of it. So, if my memory serves me correctly, I think I went back home, went back to my dad and stepmoms, and humbled myself and just said, hey, man, it's, you know, it's time to get, you know, I don't want this kind of life. But I found out that I obviously wasn't as ready to quit. I, I obviously didn't, I didn't hate that life as much as I thought I did because it was no time I was back out in it again. And it didn't take long at all for my drug addiction to spiral out of control. First time I ever got arrested, I was 19 years old. It was July of 1990. Been out drinking, partying all night with this dude. And he told me that black dude and uh, he told me that, uh, well, I don't even know, but we needed some more alcohol. It was July the 4th, 1990. Been out drinking all night. We run out of booze, man. We had to have some more damn whiskey. And uh, there was an old whiskey store, old liquor store right off the Federal Square. And uh, so me and him, he said, all right, man, we'll break in this liquor store. It was an old black lady that owned it, but it was like three or four o'clock in the morning. I said, all right, I mean, I was so drunk, I didn't give a shit, you know, just do it, man. And uh, so I stood up the corner, up the hill from where the liquor store was, and Willie went down there, there was a big old piece of asphalt in the, laying out in the parking, one of the parking spots. He picked it up, he said, man, just, is it clear? I said, I was looking, checking, make sure there weren't no cops around. He said, yeah. I said, yeah, it's clear, go ahead. I didn't know what the hell he was gonna do. Man, he slung that piece of asphalt through that front window and I mean, it shattered it, dude. And when it shattered, burglar alarms went off and it was like, oh Lord, man. I, I didn't know whether to run or what. But he started grabbing, reaching inside the window the way the store was stocked. The shelves were right inside the door or in the window. All you had to do was stand on the ground reaching and grab it. It was vodka, that's all we could get from where we were standing. So we just started packing our pants and jackets and we, we got all we could and we run off up through the back alley and behind the store, liquor store and we found us a box in the dumpster. We got that box out, set it on the ground, put all the bottles of vodka that we had just stole in it. Well, 
he, being the piece of garbage he was, that's the only life he had ever known was being in and out of jail, but I didn't. And he took advantage of that. I was gullible, you know. So he left me holding the bag. He took off and left me holding all that vodka and told me to bring it on. We were gonna go back to where he was staying. Well, we walk out from across and behind the building. Here comes a cop this way, a cop this way. I'm in the middle. Two cop cars right here and I'm in the middle. I'm going, I knew I'm going to jail. No questions asked, I'm through, I'm finished. So that's what happened. I went to jail. And my stepmom had always told me growing up that she, my stepmom, this woman that I supposedly couldn't stand, she had always told me growing up that she would bail me out of jail one time. That was it, that was gonna be it. She'd bail me out one time, but never again. But I just couldn't humble myself to call her, man. Her and my dad at no five, six o'clock in the morning to come bail me out of jail for burglary. Cause they had me charged with burglary, which is like a class, I think it was a class B or C felony. I mean, I was facing like 10 to 15 years in prison. Not jail, prison. And uh, I wound up having to call them. Uh, I was, I'd been in there like 12, 12 hours and I hadn't been out of contact and get nobody else. So I called my stepmom and my dad. And they came down there and they bailed me out. You know, my grandmother hired me a lawyer. You know, Ray Fraley, the best lawyer money could buy. And uh, got it reduced to a class E misdemeanor. I got 11 months, 29 days suspended sentence. As long as I could stay out of trouble within that year, my record was gonna be wiped clean. You know, I wouldn't be in no, you know, I'd be done. Well, huh. That shit didn't happen. I mean, that happened in July. Well, by December, five, six months, five months later, I'd already been arrested two more times and caught 10 or 11 more charges, you know. Uh, so, needless to say, my record wasn't wiped clean. The thing about it, <laughs> Active addiction, it, it doesn't only affect you, it affects everybody around you. And if you've got an immediate family, uh, wife and kids, if you're lucky enough to have them stay with you, uh, you're gonna affect them. And, uh, and sometimes it may be years down the road before you uh, realize how much you have affected them. Uh, and I'm sure my active addiction has affected my whole family in a lot of different ways. And my kids have had to witness a lot of shit. I mean, a lot. You know, uh, Haley's been to the, my oldest daughter's been to the dope house with me several times. <laughs> I mean, I've been, I've had so much dope in the car with her. I mean, she's been around more dope than she, she don't even, she don't even know how much dope she's been around. You know, Chris, my youngest son, he doesn't know. He doesn't realize how much dope he's been around. But he's been around it. You know, when he was a baby, I was at the dope man's house getting dope. Some pills one night at 10, 11 o'clock at night. Had him with me. He wasn't even a year old, and I had him at the dope house getting dope. And it's still in his car seat, in front, sitting in front of me while I was buying pills. Not even an hour after I left the dope house that night, task force kicked in the front doors and come in there with tear gas and everything. If I'd have been sitting there with my son, when they come through that door and then windows, chances are I wouldn't have my son now and I could very well be in prison, you know. But God was actually with me that night. He was protecting me and my family. They always say, they've always told me, and I believe it, I believe it wholeheartedly that before a drug addict is gonna change, they're gonna have to hit their bottom. They're gonna have to go as far down the pole as they wanna go. They're gonna have to dig their grave as deep as they wanna dig it. And then once they've had enough, they do something about it. Now, everybody's bottom's not always the same. You know, sometimes uh, they don't, drug addicts don't even get arrested. Uh, they just maybe one day just wake up before anything really bad happens in their life and they just say, hey, you know, I'm sick of this life. I want to change. 
and they do what's necessary. They change, and they they beat it, and or they arrest it. You don't ever beat the disease of addiction. You may arrest it and get a hold of it, but you don't ever beat it. You're you're gonna battle it. I'm gonna battle it till the day I die. There's drug addicts. I go to NA right now with several people, you know, that are homeless. Uh, they don't have a house. They don't have a car. They ain't got shit. They ain't got. They, they've lost their wife. They lost their husbands. They've lost their custody of their kids. You know, they've lost everything. So, and there's some that just flat out have lost their lives. They they did not wake up soon enough. They died before they realized that they there was hope. You know. And, uh, but I guess I could say jail was my bottom, or at least I hope it was. You know, when you wake up December the 3rd, for me it was December the 3rd, 19, or 2013, I woke up in the Lane County Jail, and I knew how I got there. My memory that night stayed with me, uh, or a lot of it. Uh, and I was in jail from December the 3rd of 2013 or January or two yeah to January the 13th of 2014 I was locked up I missed Christmas my two youngest kids birthdays I was locked up in jail you know that sucked royally and I told myself right then several times you know I remember sitting in jail I got arrested on December the 3rd December the 5th I went to court I had a court appointed attorney he told me, or she told me, boy, she was a joke, too. Golly. But, you know, really, hindsight, I'm kind of glad she was a joke. I'm glad she didn't get me out right then. You know, because if she had her, I probably wouldn't be where I'm at today. But because she didn't get me out of jail, she got it continued to January the 13th, when I was going to have to go back to court. Okay, this is December the 5th. She comes back in, she says, I got your bond reduced to $7,000, uh, you, uh, your court date's January 13th. I was like, what? I said, are you out of your damn mind? I said, there is no way I'm sitting up in this damn hell hole of January 13th. I said, you are, you have lost it, woman. She said, well, she said, your bond's at $7,000. If you got the money, you can get out. I said, yeah, okay. I said, you're said and done. You know, of course, the, the money wasn't the problem. I had the money in my account to get out of jail, but the problem was having somebody that I hadn't shit on so much willing to co-sign with me to get me out of jail. Well, guess what? No, that shit wasn't happening. I guess while I was in jail, they had this big intervention shit and just said, hey, Mark's where he needs to be. Nobody's gonna help get him out. You know, uh, my aunt wouldn't even answer her damn phone. The woman that I'd always counted on, she'd always been there, never told me no, never, never. I promise you, never. 43 years, she never told me no, never. She wouldn't even answer her damn phone while I was in jail. And I'd get out of jail and she tells me why. Because she said, Mark, if I answer the phone and talk to you, <coughs> she said, I knew. I would come get you out if I ever talked to you. And she said, we knew that that's where you needed to be. So, I remember I got back to jail on December the 5th after I went to court, and I got my one hour out of my cell. First 20 days I was in jail, I was in lockdown because I was coming off all that dope and they had to keep a check on and make sure I didn't die. And uh, I got my one hour out of my cell when I got back to jail, and I made my phone call. The only person I could really call at that point in time was Haley, my daughter, because I wasn't even supposed to talk to Karen. Haley told me, she said, I begged her. It was like, I called her, I said, I begged her to get, come get me out of jail, please. I, you know, she was 18 at the time. I knew she could co-sign for me if she just would. I said, damn, Haley, I got the money. All I need you to do is sign a damn piece of paper. Why can't you, you know, I begged her. I'm not doing it, Dad. You know, so I'm in my... My back was against the wall. I mean, I didn't have no choice. So uh, I remember I went back in my jail cell, the door locked behind me. I laid down on my bed and I looked straight up at the sky. And this, I just, I told God right then, that was on December the 5th. I told him right then, I said, okay, God. I said, this is it right here. I said, I'm tired. I'm tired of fighting. 
I'm tired of beating myself up. I'm tired of hurting the people I love. I said, this is it. I'm going to take this opportunity. I'm not going to say nothing to nobody about bonding out of jail anymore. I'm just going to do my time up in here until I go to court on the 13th. Hopefully, I'll get out then. By that time, I'll be detoxed off all the dope I'm on. I can get out drug-free for once in my life, get a job, and start my life over again. And, and worst, best case scenario, at least be a good parent, that father to my kids, the kind of father that my kids need. Now, when I got out of jail, I didn't know what kind of relationship I was gonna have with my wife. I really thought it was over with, but by the grace of God, it wasn't, you know? But, uh, I mean, that was my bottom, you know, or at least I think it was, I hope like hell it was. You know, going to jail and having to miss Christmas with my family for the first time, I, just, I mean, that was just it, you know? Drugs is not the problem, Mark's a problem, and there's a lot of uh, Mark that needs to be worked on, but I'm slowly working on it every day. And, uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things I need to do different. But, you know, God makes it easier. I mean, I, you know, he's always been there. Even when I was out getting high in active addiction, he was there. He was in that truck with me that night. I drove 30 miles on the interstate and didn't kill nobody. He was in a truck with me that, that day. I drove two or three miles down 110 Highway and wrecked. He hit a ditch and didn't wreck or kill nobody. He's, he was in a car with me when I hit that light pole. You know, so he, he was, he's always there regardless of what you're doing. Whether you're doing what he tells you to do or not, or what he wants you to do, he's always there. I mean, all you gotta do is just acknowledge him. I mean, he's never left. I just left him, he didn't leave me. And I still do that to this day sometimes. I, like I said, I catch myself saying, you know, man, I want, God, you gonna, you, gonna, you gonna ride shotgun, I'm driving. You know, but it doesn't take long for me to realize this is a bad idea. And things tend to work out a whole lot better. God is the reason I'm still sitting here. I slip up every day. You know, I'm not perfect, but I try to live a godly life. I mean, he's the reason I'm clean. He's the reason I'm alive. He's the reason I got clothes on my back. He's the reason I got a roof over my head. He's the reason I still got my family. You know, I mean, he's the reason I got a good job. I mean, he's the reason for everything. I try to stay focused on that. I mean, you know, I slip up, man. I'm not perfect. I mean, I can cuss like a sailor, and you know, I mean, but God's still gonna love me. But I mean, that doesn't mean it's okay to do it. But He loves me still, just the same, just like He loves anybody. And that's the thing that drives me now, is that I know my heart's in the right place. 